I'm going to invite you to turn again to uh, Romans chapter 8, um, and we'll um, continue looking at, um, I think I'm going to, I'm almost tempted to stop saying this, because almost every time I turn the page on what the next passage is, somebody somewhere, a really well-known, respected preacher, teacher, or theologian says, this might be the greatest passage in the Bible. Um, more people than not say Romans is the greatest book in the Bible. Um, lots of people um, say Romans chapter 8 is the best chapter in the best book in the Bible. And as we get into the verses we're going to look at today, verses 26, 27, and particularly next week when we get to verse 28, they say this is it. This is the best of the best of the best. Um, and here's why. Because it gets to some very practical things that the Bible says to us, and more importantly, what God promises to us. And so, um, I've entitled this um, sermon, Help Added to Hope. So if you were here the last couple weeks, we talked about the hope that God gives us in Jesus Christ. And so we've looked at being children of God, adopted as sons and daughters of God with an inheritance. And we get assurance and intimacy and all kinds of things with God, so much so that we call him Abba, Father. It's this closeness and this love relationship that God has with his children. And last week we uh, talked about the fact that the difficulty in the journey can um, uh, be tempting for us to, to take our eyes off the end, um, knowing that in glory, all the brokenness and fallenness of this world, even our own suffering as we suffer with and for Christ, um, will pale in comparison. In fact, Paul goes far in that. He says, it's not even comparable. Like, it can't be compared um, to the greatness of the glory. And so there comes a day when Jesus comes again and everything, everything will be set right. No more sickness, sorrow, and dying. No more broken relationships. No more feeling distant from God. No more suffering for the cause of Christ. But here's what makes this passage so great, is that it's not just a hope that's in our minds or even in our hearts that sustains us. We actually get help from God as well. Now, practically, I think we all understand what that might mean, right? Um, is that, let's say, the last couple days. Anybody not aware that it's been kind of warm, right? Um, did anybody do any yard work or anything like that the last couple of days? Boy, that was not fun. Um, in fact, Friday morning, I was here and at, I don't know, by 10.30 Friday morning, the heat index was already over 100. Um, and as I was going in and out, I was doing a lot of things, getting ready for today. So we had a guy working up on the roof doing something for us right out here. Yes, we're still trying to get the leak stopped and all that. So somebody was up there. Um, we had somebody in the attic working on an air conditioner. Um, and he was trying to get out. He came at 6 o'clock to try to beat the heat, and at 10.30 he was still up there. When he came out, he looked like he had jumped in a swimming pool. He was covered head to toe in sweat. And then there were some guys, I don't know if you noticed when you came here, they were shoveling um, uh, uh, stuff into the playground out there, some mulch um, to add to it. It kind of a lot of ours had gotten washed away. And when I was walking to my car, there was a guy pushing a wheelbarrow, shoveling that stuff again, just could not have looked and felt hotter um, out there. And I was tempted to say, and I didn't say this, but I was tempted to say, y'all don't get too hot. Um, that might be hope is, or I could have said, hey, make sure and drink enough um, so you don't get dehydrated. I could have even said, if you get too hot, come on inside for a few minutes. In fact, I told the guy in the attic, said, there's lots of ice in the kitchen, get you refill your um, glass or whatever. But that's all hope to say, do something for yourself or here's something you might be able to do. It'd be altogether different if I said, I can recognize that you're going to get too hot, so let me do it for you. You go sit in the air conditioning and I'll get on the roof, I'll go into the attic and I'll do the shoveling out here. Now I didn't do that, but I didn't say, hey, don't get too hot. Either You see, only saying what will happen is a very good thing. Knowing as a Christian 
where all of this ends can help sustain us in times, but that's not where God stops. He actually enters in to life with us and sees us through, strengthens us, empowers us, and yes, encourages us and things like that, but there is real help to be added to hope. And so that's where we pick up today. So let's read um, just a very short two verses right in the middle of this. And I'm going to take, I know there's people visiting here, um, but I'm not, I'd like to read this whole chapter every, and this is the fourth sermon we've had out of this chapter, but for time's sake, we won't read all of it. So I'm going to take for granted that some of you are getting some of the context. I'll refer back to this, but even these two verses on their own speak volumes to us about the kind of help that we have. So Romans chapter 8, we're going to start with verse 26 and just read the, these two verses, 26 and 27. So hear the word of the Lord for us today. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So let me say a couple of things here. First of all, when it says intercedes for the saints, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a saint. When Paul writes his letters, normally he says to the saints at, and he's talking about those who belong to God. Children of God, those who by grace through faith have trusted in Jesus Christ. And so this is, if you are here today and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this is for you. It's a help. It's a promise that this help will come. Also, we should know that um, this is the third groaning in this passage. So if you were here last week, I referred to this. It said uh, earlier in chapter 8, um, the creation itself groans, and we talked about the fallen, remember the thorns and the thistles and the sweat of our brow as we seek to live in this broken, fallen, sinful world um, is that even the creation itself longs for everything to be made right. And then it says, we as Christians also groan. It's this, um, uh, you can understand, it says, even as in the pangs of childbirth, um, we groan. Is yes, it's difficult, but boy, something great is coming. But here it says the Spirit in us groans with words or groanings too deep for words. And so we'll come to that in just a minute. But let's start at the beginning. Why does it say likewise? Well, part of that is it's the third groaning. So he says, yes, creation groans, and yes, um, uh, believers, Christians groan and long for the coming of Christ, but similarly, um, the Spirit is groaning, but it doesn't say, it's not speaking specifically of the groaning, it says likewise the Spirit helps in our weakness. And so what Paul has been describing as our help, all the things that God has provided for us as children of God, the great and precious promises. Now he says, just as that is meant to be a help to us. In fact, one person put it this way. We looked at our hope, a confident expectancy. So hope isn't a wish. It is a confidence in God that will help us persevere in difficult times, even in suffering. Now we're encouraged by the help of the Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit also is a help. Your version may say, in the same way. In context, the comparison appears to be between the way hope sustains us in the midst of present sufferings and also in the same way the Spirit sustains us by this, personally aiding us in our weakness. This idea is that we have more than enough resources to keep us going during earthly trials. Hope and help for the future. That's good news, isn't it? Some of you came here today to hear something like that. Um, that there is help. That there are people, when a crowd this size is gathered here, there are people who I know in your heart of hearts, you're saying, look, I'm hanging by a thread today. 
I could barely have it in me this morning to get here. I need to hear something from the Lord. And I pray this is his word to you today. Help comes with the hope. So what does he say that help looks like? Well, the first thing in verse 26, he says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. When we feel too weak to act like children of God, listen to that again, when we feel too weak to act like children of God, because some of you could have left here last week thinking, well, that's great that you told me I have hope as a child of God, but some days I don't feel like it. That's not a foreign concept to the Apostle Paul. I hope it's not a foreign concept to you that feelings will lie to you. You know that? If we were an amen saying church, you could say amen to that, right? Feelings will lie to us. And so just because we don't feel that <coughs> excuse me, closeness to God doesn't mean that it's not there. And when we feel that distance, that weakness that he talks about here, now he says, I'll help you in that moment. And so, when we feel too weak to act like children of God, confidently approaching our Abba, Father, the Spirit helps us. When we feel that we have no words to pray, we don't need to feel that we cannot pray. Tim Keller said that. comes from a pretty reliable source. Um, when we don't know what to pray... Um, and that's a lot of things in polite company. We don't like to admit that, that we've reached a point in our life like, I don't even know what to say to God. I'm in such a predicament here. I'm in such a low state. I don't even know what to pray or how to pray it. I want you to be encouraged that the Apostle Paul writing to sons and daughters of God, people who belong, people of true faith, he called them saints. He says, I know sometimes you get to that point. I want you to know there's help for you in that point. The idea is that we have resources in the midst of that. And so this word, when it says the Spirit helps, um, it's not just an encouraging word. In fact, the word help there in the Greek would be coming to another's aid by taking hold of the load he is carrying. You get the picture of that? If I'm walking down the road with a big heavy load on my shoulder and I'm been, beginning to strain under it, look, I'll be glad for you to go, hey, don't give up. You can do it. But you know, sometimes we reach a point where I can't do it. What I really need is for someone to take hold of the load with me and sometimes for me. That's what I really need when I'm struggling under the load. Kent Hughes says the Holy Spirit does not give armchair advice. He rolls up his sleeves and helps us bear our weakness. That is real help. Do you think of God in those terms? He's not just some distant grandfatherly person that wishes and hopes the best for us in that sense. Is a God who says, I will help. We heard that in the call to worship today. We heard that in the prayer of confession. We heard that in the children's sermon already today. God is a God who helps. And specifically, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, rolls up his sleeves and takes hold. That is real help. And then it acknowledges, again, that he helps in our weakness. Not that that's the only time. I don't believe God stands back and goes, hey, let me know when you need my help that his help comes constantly, always, all the time. But particularly, we can take hope because there is help. This refers, this weakness, our human limitations due to our own sinfulness, which produces weakness in us. Why are we weak? Because we don't have all the faith that we should. God doesn't measure you by how much faith you have. It's what are you trusting in. And he's telling us here, you can trust in his help. Lean on him. Give it over to him. And even when we don't know how to ask for God's help. I dare say many of you have been in that spot. Crying out in those ways in which all we can get out is help me Jesus. Those are the moments in which we can trust that real help is available to us. And it's help that's actually help. You know, sometimes we all have that friend that's willing to come help, but it's not all that much help. 
kind of thing. This is real help, the professional kind of help, the perfect kind of help. I was thinking this, I was in the car yesterday and I had the sports talk radio on and they were singing the praises of a Major League Baseball player that many of you know named Shoei Otani. Um, he's a guy that came from Japan and he's taken Major League Baseball by storm. If you're a fan, I know some of y'all from Colorado might be Rockies fans, I'm sorry, he's probably the best baseball player in the league now. In fact, they were saying yesterday, he might be the best baseball player ever. If you don't know him, he's the best hitter in the league. He's also maybe the best pitcher in the league right now. Something that hasn't happened since Babe Ruth. He's broken some records that go back before Babe Ruth was even born. 1890-something, he broke some records. Let's just say he's good. And so let's say after church, out in this beautiful weather we have, you got a little pickup baseball game going on in your backyard, and your team is down 10 runs. And you said, we need some help. And somebody says, I got the perfect person. I live right next door to Showy. Let me go over there and see if he's available. And Showy comes and shows up. What do you want from him? Do you want hitting advice? Do you want him to call pitches? Do you want him to coach the bases? No. You want him to run, throw, hit, catch, all the things because he is good at it. In human terms, he's almost the perfect person to come. We don't want him to just stand on the sidelines and tell him, hey, you can win this thing. We want him to come and give actual help. That's the picture going on here. That is good news. And that's why somebody could look at these verses and go, this may be one of the greatest places in there. But it gets even better. So it, he helps in our weakness. But then look at what verse uh, 26 went on to say, For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us <coughs> excuse me, with groanings too deep for words. One writer says there's mystery here. I don't completely pretend to understand all that too. What is exactly that he's saying that the Spirit is doing um, with groanings too deep for words? I think there's this emotional um, letting out of um, emotions in some kind of physical kind of way that he's describing a spiritual truth there. And there's mystery in it, but um, this writer says we're peering into the unseen spiritual realm where the Spirit is at work on our behalf. And although we cannot understand it all, we can take infinite encourage from the fact that a groan may sometimes be the most spiritual prayer. Some of you have groaned that kind of prayer in the midst of things. But when he says the Spirit intercedes, that is that the Spirit is bringing a petition before the King on behalf of someone else. He is doing something for us. He's not just showing us the way to the throne of grace. He is going before the throne of grace for us. He is asking for something and that groaning for with two deep words gives some urgency and some intensity to it. He's not offering a cursory prayer. Lord, if you get a chance um, help this person, he's going personally before God on our behalf. And that word groanings is the kind of thing that language can't even express it. Paul's trying to say, here's something I can't describe. Maybe even the Spirit himself can't describe this. But they are communication between the Spirit and the Father. Groanings. What a word, one person says. And to be used of the Spirit of the Almighty himself. How shallow is our appreciation of what is done both by Christ for us and by the Spirit within us. You see, Romans has been kind of bringing up out of the depths to know who Jesus is, what he's done, and our eyes are to be lifted to heaven and go, what an amazing Savior we have. Paul says, well, let me tell you about something else that's great. Let me tell you about this Spirit that lives in you. Chapter 8 has already said, if you belong to Christ, the Spirit lives in you. This isn't for some extra class of Christian that we all hope to get to that level. This is true of every Christian. And he says one of the things he does is when we don't know what we ought to pray for, the Spirit does. Searches our hearts. 
Is there anything, one person says, that more clearly captures the experience of weakness and a feeling of helplessness than not to know what we ought to pray? And again, some of you very acutely know that situation. I'm so desperate. I'm hurting so badly here. I don't even know what to ask God for. I don't even see what the future could be from where I am now. And if the Spirit helps and intercedes, isn't that something that we ought to know, trust, and believe um, from the core of our being? Share something with you. Um, I always am scared to do this last minute, but this morning um, I was reading a devotional very early um, this morning. And, you know, when you spend your time in the Word for a week, lots of things, you know, the principle when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, so God speaks to us when we set ourselves down in his word sometime. And this spoke to me this morning, particularly about children. So I want to speak to children and to parents this morning on this principle that God is for you and with you and offers help with hope. And so um, this comes from a writer named William Osborne. It's just a little devotional. I get emailed every day, several different devotions. Some days I read them, some days not. But this morning, um, before I did anything else um, here at the office this morning, I read this. And I, I want you to hear this. So this is entitled, God the Protector, at least this part of this article. As much as we might hope, we never grow out of fear. Wow, that's a big statement. As much as we might want to, we never grow out of fear of not knowing the future, not knowing how we'll get through the future. Here's what he says. Like a parasite clinging to the growing limbs of our faith, it seems to follow us through the various stages of life. But age provides perspective and courage that is hard to come by in our youth. Indeed, the wonder and excitement of childhood also comes with surges of fear stemming from uncertainties and newness of life. Whether it's the darkness of the bedroom, shout out to Michelle for the children's sermon today, or walking into a new classroom, fear is fundamental to being a kid. So if it's fundamental to it, and it's almost unavoidable, not only as a child, but also as an adult, what does God say to us? Well, in these moments, God's word bolsters us. That means lifts us up, encourages us with us. Things like this, Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? God is our light in the darkness. He is our mountain of refuge to which we can run. Obviously, to us and our kids, God is not literally the light. And he goes on to say, look, those are analogies that maybe at certain ages we don't fully understand. But here's what I want to say to you this morning. There is a promise in the scripture from womb to tomb um, about this earth is that God is not only for us. He not only offers hope in the end, he offers real help today. And so I also know in the world we live in today, you don't have to be an adult before you realize this is a broken, messed up, fallen world. And wherever you are today, there is real hope, but there's real help. And whatever, uh, we, sometimes I think we mistakenly dismiss the fears and the uncertainty of the future for kids. Oh, you'll see when you grow up. Those can be real hardships and fears. Maybe we do it with people who are reaching closer to the end of their life. Well, you've lived long enough, you know all these truths. We all need to hear God is a God of help. And even when we don't know what God wants, we don't even know how to ask for it, he helps. Let me close with this. Verse 27 um, says, He who searches hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. How many of you know it's hard to know what to pray sometimes because I don't really know what God wants in this situation? And it feels kind of tried and not an earnest enough prayer to say, God, just do what you want. Because part of me says, I know what I want, and I really want that to be what God wants. Um, John Piper, again, I, I use his name a lot, but he, he puts it this way, as he often does, a way that just really touched my heart. So what is it that we don't know what to pray for in this weakness? So he asked the question, you, we've read these verses, we've heard some of these things. What is he really saying? He says, I think the answer is, we don't know the secret will of God about our sickness or our hardships. 
We don't know whether we should pray for healing or for strength to endure. Did you get that? We don't know sometimes. We think the automatic is, I need to pray that this will just be gone. But sometimes God says, I want you to endure in this. I may not take it away. Of course, both are right. It's not wrong to pray for either one of those. But we long to pray with great faith. And we groan that we are not sure what God's way will be with this sickness or this loss or this imprisonment. We just don't know. And he points us to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul asks three times for his thorn in the flesh, something that he was suffering with to be taken away, to be removed. And finally, Jesus revealed to him that it will not be taken away. Surely that hardship and that imprisonment, what God's will was, whether it was healing or not or deliverance or not, he wasn't sure. And he prayed for it to be taken away. That's our natural fallback. But sometimes God says, I'm doing something here in you. And God reminds him of the hope he has. My grace is sufficient for you. And so when Paul was in prison in Rome, at least for a time, um, he might have been unsure what to pray there. His life and his ministry or courage for death. So Paul's in prison saying, I don't know what's going to happen here. I may die in prison, I may be executed by the Roman government, but I'd really like to go on ministering. And in Philippians uh, chapter 1, I think I put this up here for you, look at what he says. If I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. I don't know which to choose. The Apostle Paul says, I don't know which of these God wants most for me, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that's very much better, yet to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So even the Apostle Paul is saying, I don't know what to pray here, but here to the Romans he's saying, in those moments, and I've had those moments, the Holy Spirit's interceding for me. So when I can't put the words to it, when I can't put the right words to it, the Holy Spirit does it for me. And so now it's painfully relevant to us that God has promised this and will do this in us and for us. Already, I dare say, um, I don't think it's overstating, probably every person in here is thinking of situations either currently in the past or something that may be coming where you go, yeah, Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I know what he's talking about here. So can we receive that help? Can we receive the hope of God's word, the hope for the future that God is doing this, but God's promise that I will be there with you? In fact, um, please come back next week. Um, We haven't even got to the really good part of this chapter yet. We get a guarantee to go along with this. A guarantee right from God's mouth that he's doing something good in you and he will see it through until the end and nothing will separate you from his love. And here he says, how do I know that? Because I'm helping along the way. Kent Hughes, another author, says this, there have been times when something has been said to us that is so devastating and we are so hurt we cannot pray. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. One day, some of us will lie in hospitals with catheters and IVs, and we will not have the will to pray or even put two thoughts together. But the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. The Holy Spirit expresses those things we feel, but we cannot articulate. The Holy Spirit says those things we want to say but cannot mouth, how beautiful May we appreciate our wealth. That last statement caught me off guard. Can we appreciate being a son or a daughter of God that he says, look, I'll lift your eyes. Remember last week that word crane our neck um, to see the glory of the coming Christ. But until then, I will actually help. I give you strength power, wisdom, insight, and even more than that, somebody will come and speak to me personally on your behalf and offer real roll-up-your-sleeves kind of help. Help. That's a 
really great kind of wealth, is it not? So let's go up from here in that promise, in that hope, and with that help. It's demonstrated before us here. Our help and our Savior in Jesus Christ, the body and blood of Christ has now taken us from sin and death and judgment and wrath and brought us into the household of God, sons and daughters of God. Let's live like that. Let's trust in what God says and what he does in leading us up from here. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we've heard your great and precious promises. I pray that every one of us, from the youngest to the oldest here today, would experience a measure uh, of your help that whatever may be going on in our lives today, that we would know that the Holy Spirit is lifting us up, is speaking to you on our behalf, and that real help has been given. I pray that we would feel that, that we would live in light of that, and we could share that good news. If there are those here today that have never known uh, the saving grace of Jesus Christ, have never known the hope of of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit working in them, that you would do a work today that call them um, into the family, adopting them as sons and daughters, that the free gift of salvation could be received this day. Bless us as we go to your table. Uh, let that be pictured uh, in what we do and say here and let us feel a closeness to Christ in it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.